Hi everyone, it's Michael. So I have another very nice miniature for you guys today. Um, this one is from the 2012 Elmo. So it's a, a math contest um, at a program in the U.S. that tries to prepare students for um, the International Math Olympiad. Um, so it's a very simple um, problem, although not that easy. So uh, if you want to try to solve it, uh, feel free to pause the video. All right, so now I'm gonna go over it. So we have a triangle ABC with in center I. Uh, the foot of the perpendicular from I to BC is D, and the foot of the perpendicular from I to AD is P. And we wanna show that BPD, or angle BPD is equal to angle DPC. Okay, so we wanna show that PD is an angle bisector of uh, BPC. So, one of the things I thought when I saw this is, well, we know that IP is perpendicular to AD from the problem statement. If we were to extend IP past point P, it would form a right angle uh, with a segment DP. So if we let IP hit um, the extension of segment BC at a point, then because we have a right angle, um, and uh, an angle bisector, um, that would mean by a well-known theorem that those four points would have to be in harmonic conjugation. So basically, I want to show that the ex if I extend IP to cut BC at a point, then I want to show that that point is in harmonic conjugation with the other three points, B, D, and C. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to extend it yet, but I'm going to try to see, is there another way we can get that point that's in harmonic conjugation with the other three? Um, and so it turns out, if you label um, the other two tangent C points of the inner circle E and F, and you let EF intersect BC at a point, um, which I'm calling G, then G has to be in harmonic conjugation with B, D, and C. So why is this true? Um, so, if so, by a well-known theorem, if if A D B E and C F concur, um, then by that well-known theorem, G B D and C have to be in harmonic conjugation. So, really, we want to show that the intersection of P I with B C is in harmonic conjugation. But if G is in harmonic conjugation with those three points, then that would mean that eventually we want to show I P. Um, also passes through G. Okay, but so I kind of just said C, F, B, E, and A, D concur. How do we know that? Um, so they concur at a well-known point called the Jergon point, but it can be proven fairly easy, easily using Cheva's theorem that they concur. Um, because um, if you look at um, so we're looking at A, D, B, E, and C, F. If you try to apply the converse of Cheva's theorem on those three Chevians, you would get the ratio B, F over F, A times A, E over E, C times C, D over B, D. And that has to equal one. It's not too hard to see that because the tangents from each of the three vertices to the inner circle have to um, be equal. So B, D is equal to B, F. So those two cancel. AF is equal to AE, so those two cancel, and CE is equal to CD, so those two cancel, and you're just left with one. So that's why those three have to concur, and because they concur by that well-known theorem G, B, D, and C are, have to be in harmonic conjugation. Uh, there's one other way to see that these concur. Uh, you can use a uh, degenerate form of Pascal's theorem to show it. Um, but actually, really, it would be Briancon's theorem. Um, but I'm not going to go too much into that right now. Okay, so basically, because they concur, we know that G, D, B, and C are in harmonic conjugation. So we want to show that I, P passes through G, because if that were true, then, then that would mean since G, P, D is 90 degrees, um, B, PD would have to be an angle bisector of BPC. Okay. So how do we show IP and G are collinear? 
Uh, I'm going to try to use the radical axis theorem here. So this, this proof kind of reminds me a lot of my proof of the HM theorem. I think it might be video around video five, but um, so the HM theorem is with the ortho center, whereas this one is with the in center. So it's kind of interesting, but very similar idea. Um, I'm gonna try to use the radical axis theorem. Um, so I wanna show that EF, um, BC and IP all concur. And so that would mean IP would have to pass through G. Um, so first, um, one thing I'm gonna note is that since IPA is 90 um, by um, the problem statement, and also obviously we have to have IFA is 90 and IEA is 90, because F and E are uh, tangents to the in circle. Um, since those are all right angles subtending um, IA, that means that IP, FA, E has to be cyclic. Um, and I is the diameter in that case. Okay, so we can see that the radical axis of that circle, um, IPFAE, and the end circle is EF. So that's one of the three radical axes that we want. Um, but then we want IP to be another radical axis in the equation. So what circle has um, passes through P and I that we could use? And it turns out that the circumcircle of IPB actually works. Um, so if you look at the circumcircle of IPB, uh, the radical axis of it with um, IPFAE, so that this circle is, is obviously IP, but then what's the radical axis of it with the in circle? Um, so basically to, to get the problem to be true, we would hope that the radical axis of IPD with the end circle would be BC, because um, that would mean then we could show that those three lines concur. And it turns out that this is actually true, and it's um, not hard to see. So basically, since IPD is 90 and IDC is also 90, if we drew the circumcircle of IPD, um, that would mean DC would have to be tangent to the circle because um, this angle IPD, it's like an inscribed angle, and it's equal to the angle that ID makes with the tangent line. So I'm going to write that out. So angle IPD is angle IDC, and they're both 90 degrees. So the circumcircle of IPD has to be tangent to BC. Okay. So basically both the in circle is tangent to BC, and the circumcircle of IPD is tangent to BC. So if they're both tangent at point D, then their radical axis has to be the side BC. Um, and so now we're very close to solving the problem. So by the radical axis theorem, um, EF, that's the radical axis of um, IFPAE and um, the in circle. So that's one of the three. The other is PI, that's the radical axis of that circle with um, the circumcircle of IPD, and then BC, which we just mentioned is the third radical axis, um, those three have to concur. And since two of them already meet at a point we've called G, that means IP has to pass through G by the radical axis theorem. And once we know that, um, we knew from before that GDBC are in harmonic conjugation so because of that, from a well-known theorem, since GPD is 90 degrees, um, because they're in harmonic conjugation, that, that means that um, if you look at um, angle BPC, that means that PD and PG have to be the internal and external angle bisectors of that. Um, so I, I mentioned that theorem in my last video, but it pops up so frequently that I would definitely um, encourage memorizing it. I think I also brought it up with my proof of Blanchett's theorem. Um, so because GPD is 90 degrees and GDBC are in a harmonic conjugation, PD is the angle bisector of BPC. Um, and so therefore uh, we solved the problem because we showed that that means that angle BPD is angle DPC.
Um, so I used to, not long ago, I used to be very afraid of using harmonic conjugation and cross ratios, but just working through a couple of problems, it seems to be incredibly useful. Like now I can see it in almost every problem I work on. Um, so it's helped me a lot. Um, so I would encourage everyone else to learn it. Uh, so if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more like this, uh, feel free to subscribe to my channel. Uh, thanks, everyone.